Recording in progress. Good morning, everyone. Good morning um, to all the youth in agriculture. Good morning to all the participants who will be starting in the short while. Um, I would like just to give another minute or so. I see the attendees are still trying to log in. And then we'll start in a short while. Okay, thank you. Uh, Doc, I think already people are already joined. So hey, Hello. How are you? I'm doing okay. How are you? Good, good. I mean, I'm getting calls. That's why I keep on going off. People are asking about the password. Is there a password that people need in order? For okay. Um, Marcella, can you assist us on that? Ignatius? But because the, I think it was... Um, yes, um, it's 309714. You said there was no password required. You just link in. Oh, there's no password required. Yeah. yeah, I think if you have a link, it will take you straight. Um, I see the on the on the chat box. I mean, on it the does. It does, but there's also a password uh, chairperson. Okay. In case, what the, what is the password, ma'am? Three zero nine seven one four. Three zero nine. the chat box. Seven one four. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope that will start. I think we are now exactly 10 past um, 10 o'clock um, from our session. Let me then welcome you all and officially start this session on the youth day. We are having a session that's um, trying to address some of the issues and the opportunities that are affecting our youth, and ensuring that we encourage the youth participation in agriculture. We're going to be very, very exciting uh, morning. We have our minister in presence. Um, we also have most of our youth leaders, farmers, and other um, actors on the agricultural value chain that will be with us this morning. We also going to be having some encouraging discussion from the senior government official that will be telling us a lot of programs that they are running dedicated in this May I perhaps ask as we start, um, just to ensure we switch off our mic so that we allow those that are on the platform to not have feedback. Um, I know that um, we have retained the password 309714 for those that are still struggling to join in. We see the numbers are growing. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Fiso Ndombela is my surname. I work for the South African government, I'm stationed in the National Agricultural Marketing Council, which is the agency of the Department of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development. I would like to welcome you all in this uh, uh, in this webinar on, on youth in agriculture. Um, we have very um, uh, limited timelines, as we know that in various part of our country, they are still experiencing some of the low trading. We also know that this morning, because we are engaging with the youth in, that are actually on the ground in agriculture, they might be having to go back and deal with some of their daily operations on their farms. So we want to get on with the business of day and ensure that everybody benefit from their good insight. Ladies and gentlemen, we know that we are studying this youth in agriculture, knowing that the sector is one of the sectors that has been doing relatively well, despite the regulation that affected the, 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 the economy and also with uh, some of the biosecurity nature. Um, some of it uh, challenges which in access into, especially for the youth, that wants to participate in the sector and access whether you're looking at credit or the means of production. And we're hoping today we'll hear some of the efforts that have been designed by our government to ensure that it assists our farmers. It ensures that it creates jobs, 
it ensures that it uplifts some of the rural areas. As we know, the bulk of our agricultural operations are sitting in the areas where there's still limited investment in terms of infrastructure, limited investment in terms of some other ICT systems that are required to make sure that agriculture is competing at the level of global. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to then start inviting our first uh, speaker of today to provide us with the keynote address, our Minister Umam Togoti Diza from the Department of Agriculture. Mr. Nishwa, the floor is yours. Let me welcome you. Thank you very much, uh, Suiso, uh, for directing our program. I would like to acknowledge our esteemed panelists, our young farmers present on this platform today, our senior officials of the department who are here. I also saw our uh, chief financial officer, um, Ms. Rendani Sadiki, who is very important because she carries the purse, which is one of the important catalysts that agriculture needs. But also I've seen some of our DDGs that are responsible for land uh, reform, again, an asset that our young farmers would like to access very much. I would like to start my um, intervention because it's really not the speech because we would like to hear young people talking to us today. But it's important for us maybe to just remind ourselves of what uh, Franz Fanon said, I quote, each generation out of relative obscurity must discover its mission, fulfill it or abandon it, close quote. I raise this particularly as we celebrate a youth uh, month in our country, commemorating the role that young people had played in the liberation struggle of our people. It is this generation which was faced by a particular reality during its time that decided to respond in a particular way through mobilization, but also ensuring that they actually confront the then apartheid regime. Part of this young cohort, it's those people who went into exile. Some of them remained here at home, continuing with the struggle for our liberation. And therefore, a majority of these young people we celebrate of that era set related on what the challenges were and decided on a mission for liberation. And I think today's young people have a similar task where they must reflect and find its mission and fulfill it. And their mission is rebuilding a non-racial, non-sexist, prosperous South Africa. And I hope as young people in the agricultural sector, having this in our background, armed with the history of those who went before us, and at the same time, encouraged by the history of our parents, our grandparents, like Mama Charlotte McLeague, who during their time also discovered their mission and acted in order for us to be liberated. That the young people of today in the task of rebuilding our society will actually find its mission and fulfill it. Today we celebrate Youth Day under the COVID-19 pandemic. Currently as a country we are said to be in the third wave we're seeing the numbers increasing than they were in the past few months. As a result of the disruptions caused by this pandemic in our economy and our social life, we're unable to commemorate this important month in a low key manner than we were able to do before. But it's also important to acknowledge that COVID-19 has actually forced us out of our comfort zone, as well as ensuring that we think differently about how to do things now and in the future. It is like a reset button that has been pushed because I'm sure things will never be the same, nor will we go back 
to the old as we were before. This pandemic has also reminded us about the importance of food in our lives and the need for food security at a household level as well as nationally. COVID-19 has laid bare the fault lines that remain in our agricultural sector. The continued inequality made it difficult, particularly for smallholder farmers to absorb the shocks caused by COVID-19. Our logistics system, particularly on food delivery, also showed their weaknesses. We saw the challenges that a number of vulnerable communities in our rural areas, our informal settlements, and in our township, at times did not access their foodstuffs at the time at which they would have wanted to. All of these, in my view, were a reminder that our food systems are weak and therefore need strengthening. It is also important that we acknowledge that the pandemic has come at the point in which we're already experiencing challenges of climate change in our country. We're experiencing floods in some of the regions of our country, as well as droughts in others. It is important to share with you what as government we did in responding to the immediate challenges that were posed by this pandemic. So that as we engage, we can also reflect whether these interventions actually assisted in some way, or if not, what more do we need to do going forward? Firstly, as government, we ensured that the agricultural sector remained an essential service during the lockdown so that it can provide the necessary food and fiber that our communities required at this important time. Not only in the South African society, but also in the region, as we know that our trading, particularly with our immediate uh, partners, particularly in the SADC region, they rely almost on a number of instances on foodstuff coming from our shores. So to make sure that agriculture remains an important and an essential service was critical for sustainability of food access, not only for South Africans, but also for our region. COVID relief intervention to smallholder farmers was also given at a quantum of 50,000 to um, a million, particularly those whose operation were rather sorry, those whose operation were between 20,000 and 1 million in terms of what uh, they receive out of these activities. The provinces also assisted those uh, farmers who were affected by the drought through the resources that uh, government had expended. The Pro Presidential Employment Stimulus Initiative, which specifically targeted subsistence farmers was also made available to those who qualified. These being the interventions that the state has made in an immediate response, it is important for us to look at how do we prepare for the future living with the pandemic and maybe other challenges that we are going to face in the future. Knowing that the pandemic its origin is zoonotic, meaning that it comes from animals and then found a host and finally to humans. It is important that as a country and globally, we start to look at how we treat our health system. the challenges of swine fever, the challenges of foot and mouth in some of our regions. These have an impact on our economy, as we know that particularly we're no more able at this moment to send our meat staff in our region and also globally because of these diseases. But it also means continuous surveillance 
that must be undertaken so that we can track the diseases and how they actually mutate between animals and human. We also need, as we plan ahead, to look at our technological interventions as well as scientific interventions in our agricultural sector. So that as we deal with the current challenges of today, we're also able to prepare for our future. A future agricultural sector in South Africa requires it to become inclusive. We need to build a cohort of young producers, men and women, as well as agribusiness and other entrepreneurs in the space, because we know that the value chain of agriculture is not only in the production, but it also moves in other sectors such as the logistics, agricultural logistics, your agro dealers who actually provide us with inputs. At the same time, the agri processors who process from raw material to other finished products that uh, are needed by our consumers. So it is important that we look specifically, how do we respond in the needs of this young cohort of today? We have to actually listen to what young people who are the future of this agricultural sector and agribusiness of our country are saying to us. Generally, young people feel that our program do not respond to them. Young people feel that the communication of what we offer as government is actually not done in a manner that it attracts young people to actually come through. But also even the medium that we used in you know, communicating to young people is somewhat a bit archaic in a sense, maybe because a majority of us are not really uh, au fait with the new technologies of social media and so on. But at the same time, we also need to look at the agility of our government in being responsive to the needs that our young uh, generation requires of us today. The other challenges that young people have raised with us is the access that is a challenge. And I'm sure our panelists who are young will be able to tell us where do they really think we are failing them. When it comes to land acquisition and land access, the time it takes is too long. When it comes to our support services, at times the way these are delivered themselves take too long, but at the same time, do not take into consideration the wealth and the knowledge that is already available among this generation of our young people that we talk about today. Issues of market access are also the other challenges that young people have raised with us to say, how do you create a possibility of market access for younger generation? Do we need a kind of a set aside? I am not sure. Our financial institutions, how do we as government also with our financial packages actually relate to this new generation of our farmers? I'm reflecting on this because in my view, there are criticisms that we must take to heart as government as we try to work with these new generation of our farmers to assist them to actually take the mantle of the agricultural sector going forward. If one looks at the agricultural and agri agribusiness master plan, how does it take into consideration the views of this new generation? Because in planning ahead, we need to start to appreciate that we do have a younger generation that is already there, but also who we seek to improve and ensure that we actually attract more young people as we know that the generation of the current producers is becoming even more mature and sooner they'll be exiting the system. And therefore, 
How do we ensure that our young people take over this mental learning from the old, but bringing in the new knowledge and innovation? I thought I would reflect on these issues as we start this webinar today, because for us as government, it's important that we listen more and hear what it is that young people are saying to us in terms of the sector and how can we plug in to make sure that we resolve and provide solutions to enable them to actually succeed. I therefore want to wish you well in this webinar and I'll be keenly listening as a participant to your views and inputs. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dombele. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you very much for those very wise words. I, I think, Minister, your, your presence on its own and your also willingness to stay throughout this webinar and giving the challenge that you are here with your senior official to listen carefully of what the youth sees in agriculture as opportunities and how they want your department to assist them is pretty much a sign of how seriously you view the participation of you. And I think the youth themselves are in attendance have listened to you carefully when you said they should be able to determine what mission they want to drive within the agriculture sector, servicing both the country, but also that of the region. And I think we'll hear from them in no time, Minister, when they are able to provide you practical solutions and practical proposals of how they see the agriculture going forward. Ladies and gentlemen, what I would like to see now, uh, what I will try to do now, as we get into this dialogue of about ensuring the youth take its rightful position in the agri sector, I would like to extend from the minister's speech by inviting some of the senior government officials to first give us a sense of what are the existing programs that are already being run by the department. So that when we start getting to the crux of today's discussion, we build up on what the background would have been laid out by the senior government. Then we can give it into the youth to be able to take us forward and be able to summarize towards the end of our dialogue. Because today we want to ensure that out of this dialogue, we have practical solution that will lead into that formulation of the movement and ensuring the youth is supported correctly. Ladies and gentlemen, let me start with the most important part of the agricultural sector. As we know that for us to continue doing farming, we have to have access to land. Perhaps let me then start by allowing um, the uh, Mr. Uh, Teresendove to come in and actually start laying the foundation with some of government programs around the redistribution of land, in particular talking to the issues of youth. Mr. Ndobe, may I then invite you into the platform? Program Director, thank you so much. Um, let me take this opportunity to <clears throat> pass my greetings to the Minister, the Deputy Ministers, Acting Director General, organizers of this webinar, young people that are in this pan as panelists, uh, young farmers, um, <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, um, program director, I'm not sure how we're going to do it. Uh, I'm told that we're not, we will not be able to upload the presentation. So I'll talk from the pre presentation from my side. That's not a problem as well. Um, my presentation will focus as indicated on access to land specific, specifically for agricultural purposes by young people. I'll do the introduction, uh, look at land reform and young people, uh, look at land acquisition and allocation. I will specifically try to zoom in briefly on beneficiary selection and land allocation policy because it's a very important milestone that government has reached in terms of trying to make land accessible uh, to young people. And then I'll conclude. In, in, in my younger age, uh, when I was still a youth as well, uh, when I was still at school, <clears throat> we were taught, especially in agriculture, that there are factors of production. And these factors of production, I think Dr. Uh, 
Sufiso, you will correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm, I'm bringing this from the era of Bantu education. <clears throat> um, there are four factors of production. And all, all the time when they are mentioned, land becomes the first element of it. It's land, it's labor, capital, entrepreneurship, or, or you can call it management. Therefore, it set land to be very central for, 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 for development. And we all know that in, in the struggle for liberation in South Africa, land was very central. Fast forward 1994, the constitution, as, as well as the supporting uh, legislation, made it very clear that there is an effort by the state to reverse land disposition, colonial as well as apartheid laws that denied Africans, Black in particular, access to land. A program director, you realize that colleagues that will come after me will, will put much flesh on, onto what happens to the land. I'll be focusing on how young people can be able to access land and what are the programs available for that to happen. The NDP 2030 stated that South Africa must find a way to urgently reduce alarming levels of youth unemployment and provide people with broader opportunities. It is also important to note that the plan indicates, I quote, South Africa has urbanizing youthful population. This presents an opportunity to boost economic growth, increase employment, and reduce poverty. The Planning Commission, which was central in the development of the NDP, NDP uh, recognized young people that they bear, they bear a brand of unemployment and they adopted a youthful lens in preparing their proposal that constitute the NDP. Close quote. Land reform has three distinct elements, which are restitution of land rights, land redistribution, and land tenure. All these elements of land reform are important for the transformation of this country from the evil past where the majority of, of, of the population were denied rights and access or ownership of land. Land reform and young people. Young people are critical factor for success of land reform. And it is important that they are provided with opportuni opportunities that will enable them to access land for various purposes. Of course, agriculture being important for the today's discussion, but for also other purposes. Recently, cabinet has approved the beneficiary selection and, and land allocation policy, which also concretizes this objective. This policy allows and encourage and prioritize women where they are given 50% in terms of land access or ownership. Young people at 40% and persons with, with disabilities at 10%, which is a, a little bit higher than even the national standard. As young people, they, you are therefore amongst the target group to benefit from this policy. In terms of how we have traveled up to so far with land acquisition, up to date, we have acquired over 500, 5 million hectares of land through various instruments of land uh, redistribution. Of the 5 million hectares I'm referring to, 2.3 million hectares were acquired through proactive land acquisition strategy, which is one of the key strategies that the department has been using in the past 10 years or so to acquire land and lease it out to qualifying um, a, a, a people. The department will continue to acquire and allocate land. The 5 million I'm referring to that exclude the release of state land for agricultural purposes, land acquired through restitution 
or tenure rights. The beneficiary selection and allocation policy, it is premised on the constitution, specifically section 25. I quote, it enjoys the state to take a reasonable legislative and other measures within which its available resources to foster conditions which enable citizens to gain access to land on equitable basis, close quote. It's also supported by the white um, paper um, on South African land policy of 1997 that states the purpose of the land redistribution program is, I quote, to provide the poor with land for residential and productive purposes in order to improve their livelihood, land redistribution is intended to assist the urban and rural poor, farm workers, labor tenants, as well as emerging farmers, close quote. In terms of the basis of why the policy was established, call it a, policy, call it a, a problem statement. It was actually because of things that has been discovered, especially included in the panel for presidential panel on agriculture and land reform, as well as in the NDP. I can summarize it as follows. It is because of the lack of fairness, credible credibility and transparency in the current system, lack of access to land by vulnerable and marginalized groups, such as women, youth, and persons with disability, bias of land allocation towards agricultural use, as opposed to the wider range, inclusive of settlement and commercial uses, failure to match the beneficiaries and land availability available for allocation, resulting in underutilization or land being unproductive or not used at all, failure to provide proper and adequate support, both technical and financial, to the beneficiaries of for sustainable land redistribution pro program. Threats of food security, both at household and at national. Upon realizing these challenges, these are the key uh, policy position from that policy. To create a credible and a transparent system of land allocation and beneficiary selection, to target rural poor, landless, poor municipalities, peri-urban residents to gain access to land. This, the following one, very important, to create a crop of new young, smaller older or commercial farmers through targeting women and unemployed agricultural graduate, youth in agriculture to access land and to, for, for, for production as well as agro-processing value chain opportunities to establish independent selection for allocation purposes, ensure equitable access to land for qualifying previously disadvantaged citizens, address diverse and different land needs, promote industrialization and change of special development with a focus towards township economy, specific special economic zones, industries in rural areas promote urban agriculture through access to agricultural development. One of the important issues that relates to young people in terms of this policy is to ensure that young and, 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 young and unemployed agricultural graduate participate in the department's enterprise development, incubation, as well as other programs that support young people to ensure that government shall introduce and roll out graduate placement program in key agricultural field as a way of exposing agricultural graduates to working uh, environment and the government will partner with accredited basic and institution of higher learning, e.g. universities, colleges, agriculture, including special schools to support graduates to have practical experience and start their own enterprises. In terms of the eligibility, all South Africans um, are qualified to apply for land or access land, uh, but with my specific focus I've indicated at the beginning of women, youth, and persons with disability.
It also includes military veterans. It, it also includes, which is a new approach, spouses with the, uh, of the public servants. However, public servants who, have, um, who are still serving um, may not be included unless they've served 24 months, which we call it a calling period. Same applies to the politicians. We also focus on communal farmers, township dwellers, state land, resident or individuals. In terms of exclusion, it excludes non-South Africans. It also excludes, like I've indicated earlier, current public servants and also politicians who have not yet served their cooling period. How do you apply? Applications for agricultural land are through advertisement um, the land that is available is being advertised, it will be advertised or is being advertised and application can be done through electronic as well as manual, including walk in into the offices close by. In terms of the land for other purposes, such as common energies, human settlement, industrial development and the rest, there will be engagement, be engagement between those communities or municipalities or those departments or state agencies with the department in terms of identifying the land that is needed and acquisition of land that will be done through the department. As I conclude, we are encouraging young persons to take advantage of this opportunity, especially young women, um, because it gives them more opportunity and advantage for them to access land. If more information is needed, we can be contacted at our provincial offices, uh, through our PSSC and district offices, and it, it can also through the provincial department of agriculture throughout the country. I thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for that uh, presentation on the land. At least it gave us that um, understanding of what the government has been doing in terms of redistributing to land. I would like us to then move on while I, I plead with all the youth uh, participants at the back to just take note as they will, will open up the opportunity for reflections from them in no time. But I would like to then continue giving to the government officials. And now we're moving that, now we understand in the area of land if we now move in into the most critical part of it, the area of credit and other financial instruments that the department has to en enable the participation of the youth in agriculture. May I then invite uh, um, Ms. Eldam Giza to take us through the financial instrument that exists within the department. Um, I think you are muted, um, Elder. Apologies. Good morning, um, Minister, Deputy Ministers, young people, and Dr. Ndombela and their colleagues. I'm requested to share with you the blended finance scheme. Um, which is one of the products that the department has um, developed to support the production on land. It would have been wonderful to show you the presentation so that we can interface with it. I've forwarded it to Dr. Ndombele, if he can share. Um, yes, I can see we have shared. Um, let's move on to the next slide. I'll try and be quickly. Um, blended finance is the next slide, Dr. Ntombil. It is an instrument which um, has been developed to provide where the department or government is providing grant and it's using its grants to leverage private funding in order to increase access to affordable finance by black producers. Um, in this instance, the grants would not be accessed as a standalone. It has to be always paired with a, with a loan. What this means is that the applicant must approach the banks that we are partnering with 
if they want to access blended finance. And the bank would use its credit assessment as well as the department's scorecard, which I'm going to show you, and its qualifying criteria for you to be able to be supported. Um, in as much as this grant is not repayable, um, we expect certain behaviors on, 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 from the producers. We expect compliance to legislation. We expect that the agricultural standards are adhered to when you produce. We expect that um, there's disclosure um, on all the information that is required by the assessing banks. We expect that you, if you said you are a full-time producer, that you are a full-time producer. If you said you are going to, prof to provide uh, benefits for your farm workers, that you do exactly that. So also, if we have assisted you with a land acquisition, we expect that you do not sell that property that the department has assisted you to purchase because it is our way of accelerating land reform as you would heard with Ndade Terry that um, there are programs to assist with land acquisition. This program as well can assist you in acquiring the land. So we have put all these in the requirements in the terms and conditions for the grant, which is an agreement you would sign when you get access to blended finance from the banks. The goal of the scheme is to support sustainable commercialization of black farming enterprises. Um, we want to support enhancement of production, we all of agro-processing, as well as ensuring that we accelerate land re redistribution, as I had already said. And the value chain, I've seen that one of the expectations is for us to talk about the food systems and how you could participate. You might not necessarily be interested in farming, but you might see an opportunity with logistics, um, transporting food from the farm gates to the markets. That is also another opportunity where we can in, uh, avail with trucks, we can avail with agro-processing infrastructure if you are interested in processing the food and not necessarily interested in farming. So those are other opportunities within the food system and the value chain that can be funded through this blended finance. Um, the next slide is really the vision and mission, which I'm going to quickly pass, where we have uh, our aim is to increase uh, majority participation of black uh, commercial farmers owning and controlling the agricultural value chains. Um, which commodities do we support? The next slide. We are supporting the commodities as has been outlined in the agriculture and agro-processing master plan. I would require that you familiarize yourself with that master plan as it is a document that is going to guide our uh, development of the agricultural space within this sixth administration. You'd see that it has a lot of commodities that are catered for, which is poultry, red meat, pigari, grains, sugarcane, cotton, dairy, wool and mohair, vegetables, citrus, uh, fruits, um, nuts, forestry, and more exciting hemp and cannabis. Who qualifies is the next slide. Um, you have to be South African citizen with a valid ID document. Um, it must be black majority owned, um, supporting AMP um, commodities, as I had indicated, the commodities in the agriculture and agro-processing master plan. Um, in this instance, we are looking at majority black owning 60%, with a minimum of 40% being owned by the JV partner, where joint ventures are, are, are are, are, are being uh, applied, but the JV partner must not have 20, less than 26% stake. Ideally, we would be looking at 100% black ownership with the um, enterprise supporting farm workers, where 10% of the profit sharing goes to farm workers. And these are the things we would look monitoring to see if there's compliance uh, to the conditions of this, of, of this fund. 
you will see they have highlighted in red youth, women, people with disabilities are priority for being supported. Um, and if you are above 60 years of age, we require you to demonstrate evidence of a successor. Who does not qualify, I would pass just for uh, the benefit of time. Um, and I wanted to move into the economic benefit criteria. You'd see there um, for an enterprise to be recognized as youth, it has to be 50% owned by young people. And if it is not 50% owned by young people, it does not score a point uh, on, on this benefit criteria. So you need to score points around equity, transformation, and inclusivity. In this instance, you are young, you are women, you are a person with disability, you would, call, you would score all nine points. Um, with triple BEE, we are looking at HDIs who are 60%, as I had indicated, and a project that is supporting its employees, you would collect those eight points. Around personal risk, um, in many instances, young people would not necessarily have any equity to put in except the grant that the department is going to provide. But we also want to see your skin in the game, meaning that you have to be a full-time uh, farmer. So we want full-time involvement. We also prefer those with agricultural qualification or who have some skill in agriculture and they've been operating at least for two years within the farming uh, space. Uh, with regard to employment, your operation should at least create more than 10% permanent jobs of uh, existing jobs. If it is a startup operation, that only whatever job you, you create becomes a, a plus. There's also an expectation of previously disadvantaged people who are at management and decision-making levels. You also score a point there. Around food security, we are looking at 10% new hectares in production. Uh, if it is a startup, whatever you produce becomes a, a new uh, a, a, a growth in the production space. But if you are already existing producer, 10% of the new hectares of the previous production would earn you two points. We are looking at sustainable development. You need to use climate smart technologies or save water savings or energy saving uh, methods on your farm. You will score a point because we are in a period where climate change affects us. The total score points, we need also to look at markets. You score four points if you supply both market locally or export markets, and also your commodity replacing imports. Um, so with the 50 points, you have to have a minimum, the next slide of 20 points to be able to access the blended finance. If your scoring is less than 18, 20 points, you are not yet ready to be a client of the blended finance. You'll be able to see which other programs and products are available for, for you to access. In this instance, for small holding, we can give a grant of up to 5 million for production support and up to 10 million for land acquisition support or agro-processing acquisition support. Um, for medium scale, we can give a grant of up to 10 million and for land acquisition for medium scale operations, we would be able to give a grant up to 20 million. Um, for large scale, we're able to give a grant up to 40 million, and this would also include your communal areas where maybe a group of communities have set up a business and they have donated their land to create a commercial operation. In this instance, an example I like to make is Macademia, which is an example of the Ngeha development that we funded through the grants. Um, for land acquisition, we can give up to 50%. But for smallholder, our 5 million would be 60% of the required funding. 40% will come from the banks. 
And for medium scale, we would go 50-50, 50% will come from the department, 50% would be a loan that you'll have to repay. And for large scale, the department will only provide 40% of the required funding and 60% would have to be the funding that has to be repaid, which would be the loan by the banks. The next slide. Here we are looking at sustainability, sector focus, and with sustainability, it has to be commercially sustainable operations. If it is not, and if you are also not solvent, you are not yet ready as a beneficiary of blended finance, you need to go and access other products, which I'm quickly going to run through. We are looking at support in all provinces and also the due diligence would also be done by the banks. So if you pass all this, you would be able to qualify. The next slide, what are we supporting? We've spoken about acquisitions of primary agricultural parcels. We have spoken about um, uh, acquisitions of agro-processing facilities. We've spoken about uh, expansion in production, uh, purchasing of capital equipment. In this instance, you want to purchase a tractor um, or you need implements for your farm, you are able to come and access you need uh, working capital, you would also be able to come and access that we also subsidize insurance. This is the next slide where we are showing you our uh, first, as Minister announced it, the trailblazer for blended finance, which is the IDC. We have to have signed agreements with the banking sector at this point. We have signed up with the IDC and we have completed the review of the standard agreement with the Banking Association of South Africa. We are now at a stage of the bilaterals. We have already last week met with one bank where the bilateral started. So we are hoping that come end of June, we would be able to tell the minister which are the banking sectors that she can now announce as participating. But with the IDC, they are focusing on large uh, commercial production uh, as per their mandate. So they focus on horticulture, um, which would be your avocados, your macadamias, your blueberries, your citruses, and their minimum expansion is 200 hectares. They have already put aside 500 million uh, to, to to blend with our fund. For this, we have committed 1 billion in five years uh, with the IDC in what we call the Agri-Industrial Fund. We would also support poultry, both broilers and layers, and you'd see that their sizes are actually large scale for broilers. If you don't do 200,000 beds, or you don't have a, 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 a farm with a potential for 200,000 beds, you are not yet ready to be a beneficiary under blended under the IDC. Um, for layers, their minimum is 50,000 layers. It becomes important that we see black producers who have this size of production. So is Pigari, and we were also sitting with SAPO. IDC has committed 100 million to support 25 Pigari producers in this instance. The next slide. How do you apply or access blended finance? You go to the participating bank in this instance, if you are ready to go large, um, IDC becomes the bank that we have already signed off with. We would be signing with the land bank. I need to mention that because we need them on board to be able to access and support a large base of our producers in the country. So the application goes straight to the bank. Uh, they would use the criteria as we have discussed it of the department. And if you qualify, then it is approved by the credit committee. Then the funding is, is, is we have a steering committee, which we are going to be using to monitor the implementation of the program. The next slide, I have quickly put up the minimum requirements by the financing institutions. Um, for you to go to the bank, they need at least that you need to at least have uh, industry experience of a minimum of two years to access blended finance so that they trust that you at least know what you need to be doing because agriculture 
needs commitment. And for those who are already involved in the sector, they will tell you how much committed you need to be to be successful. They also need your original certified FICA documents. Um, there is also a requirement for a, a business plan. Um, we have developed a pamphlet. We would be able to make it available so that you can pull out and know all this information that is required for you to be able to make a successful application to these banks. The next slide here, we really have shown you that we have done a thorough analysis of the producers in the country. We know that at some of you are producing at household level, which is called subsistence producers mainly uh, production for the benefit of household consumption. We also have those who have aspirations to go commercial and they are producing currently at smallholder level and they still need to be strengthened and supported for them to be able to grow into a commercial scale. And then you have medium as well as large scale commercial. I'll that, um, two more minutes, thanks. Two minutes, okay. So those who are producing less than a million Turnover per annum, they can access our CASP, Ilimalitima, and Land Development Support, which are the grant 100% grant programs, which are provided through the provincial departments of agriculture. Um, and those who are producing of over a million, or the business plan is such that the turnover per annum is above a million, those can then access blended finance, as I have explained. Uh, quickly, with Ilema Litzema, all you need is to approach the provincial departments. We would make this information available. The next slide. These are the contact people in each province um, where you can go and get an application to uh, uh, access uh, Ilema Litzema, which is the support aimed at reducing poverty through in increased food production initiatives. Here we support household gardens, we uh, establish orchards, um, we establish vegetable gardens as well as uh, vegetable uh, uh, farms. And then the last slide, we have CASP, which is also a program where we support farmers with on-farm infrastructure. Mainly we do training also and mentorship. We support you also with the certification as SA gap certifications for you to be able to access formal markets. We also do um, uh, extension support. We strengthen extension support so that we can have extension officers going out and supporting you. What you need is proof of address. You need proof of legal access to land. We do not support anyone with no land or anyone with no legal access to land. Um, so if you have an ID and you're a South African citizen, you can qualify for both CASP and Ilema Letzima, which you then access through your provincial department. So you need to know who your extension officer is because throughout the country, we have extension officers who are assigned regions to support with knowledge, information, and advisory services. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Sis Elda, and I hope the colleagues will be able to uh, be able to uh, use this information as we get to the next session. May I then uh, quickly um, ask uh, Mr. Nasele Mishlamakulu to give us on the issues of infrastructure and the issues of program and scaling of the youth in agriculture and what the agriculture um, department is doing to assist different youth across all provinces. Mr. Nasele, your term is start now, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Ndombela, and a uh, very good morning to the minister, the executive of the department, but importantly so the youth that is with us today. I uh, hope, Chair, you have my slides, and I'm told that uh, Elda stole five minutes of my presentation, and therefore I have to run very fast on them. 
I'm going to talk about our program called NARISEC, which is our National Rural Youth Service Corps program, but also touch base on what we do in the provision of infrastructure in a rural space. This is the approach and offerings that these two programs are, are providing to, to our youth. There is a book that, that uh, was released in 2012 by a lady called Alcinda Honwana, where she introduces a phenomenon uh, and she calls it that uh, in our continent, you would remain long in Waitwood. She describes this as a virtually impossible transition for youth to social adulthood when they remain challenged to gain access to social markets that helps them to transition into that adulthood. She argues strongly on the issue of financial autonomy that remains elusive to the youth, a stable occupation that is not there, together with the subject of a social position. This remains relevant in our country because currently the existing measures are unfortunately still insufficient, both in reach and in effectiveness to deal with these issues. Compounded on this is our economic structural reform, where we currently are trapped in a middle income country, battling to generate enough jobs. This is evident on the continuous increase on the number of youth unemployment in the country. This calls for a definite new paradigm shift in the way we deal with youth employment, youth empowerment in the country. This is where then a youth driven development agenda that puts the youth at the heart of empowerment and structural transformation becomes essential. And this is what we are introducing as a NARASEC that has been repurposed. The program has been there, but uh, we conducted on our own assessments on the performance of the program because it was more on a skills development program. Uh, we also commissioned through the HSRC an evidence-based assessment again that pointed to that we needed to shift the program somehow. Uh, this is a program that looks at increasing skills among our rural youth. We want to contribute towards the improvement of the youth employment and empowerment. We also want to enhance the participation of youth in the sector, but also uh, other activities that, for example, your rural tourism, your, your built environment for, for, for road maintenance and related, as well as self-reliance and youth. So the program is implemented in, in, in about six phases. In the interest of time, I will run through them quickly, Chair. The first one is the recruitment, which I said has been repurposed. I will uh, spend a little bit of time on it so that uh, the youth uh, on the platform understand how we go about doing this. We're looking at youth as is, as defined in the country, 18 to 35 years. We're looking in particular in the rural areas, unemployed youth. We want to provide skill so that the youth can uh, better secure workplace opportunities in and out of government. Uh, but importantly, uh, which is our, we call it uh, a recruitment for purpose, is that there must be entrepreneurship opportunities and support uh, to accompany the skill that we've given to the youth. Uh, for this year, we're recruiting towards the third quarter. Uh, communication will go out in terms of how the youth can, 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 be, can participate in the program. Government has introduced the, the district development model. We embrace this uh, in the department and uh, our repurposed program of NARASEC pays particular attention to this. I don't have a highlighter chair, but we, before we recruit, we, we look for opportunities where youth comes from. The village that you are in, or the township, whatever the case may be, what are the projects, what are the opportunities that are there that uh, you can embrace, that we can support you on? We do, I will show in the next slides, a very targeted special analysis of the space and then be able to say, here we can do A, B, C, and D with sectors within the DTM approach, of course. Once you know those and exactly the capacity of each project that it can absorb how many youth, this is only when we recruit. 
because now we don't just want to recruit at the one day at the end of the program, what we're going to do with the youth recruited. That has been the problem of the program of the previous approach. So we recruit with that end in mind. Then we design very specific courses, uh, very practical, short, that are geared towards ensuring that those identified opportunities, the youth is capacitated to make sure that uh, when, when, when they are done, they can implement. Coupled with that is then the startup support that we will provide to the youth as a package to go back to your area and implement. Then we do our M&E. I won't go through all the slides in the interest of time, but, but this is the approach uh, within the district rural development plans that we develop, analyze the sector in all three uh, levels of our department is agriculture, land reform, and as well as rural development. As, as I mentioned, we identify you with the recruit and we implement. This also gets overlaid with our agriculture and agro-rosing master plan that is uh, currently being developed and finalized to ensure that the synergy and opportunities that have been identified through the commodity corridor approach and make sure that we, we are... That's the first part phase, which is the, as I said, very specific to what we'll do at the end of that training and, and, and support provided by the department. The, the next phase now, once you are in the program, we then introduce you into the induction, into orientation and to life skills programs. Uh, the various offerings of those are, are captured in this slide. I won't go through all of them in the interest of time, Chair, but we talk about personal development, goal setting and time management, diversity management, problem solving, health and wellness, communication, teamwork, career guidance, and all what else is here, in particular, the issue of political education and program, uh, the issue of consciousness of the youth and being patriotic and being proud of who you are and understanding the country and make sure that you are indeed the agent of change moving forward. And the, the next phase is on youth uh, leadership development program uh, that we conduct uh, in partnership with the army. This is now where we're using their bases, whether it's Saldana Bay in the Western Cape or any other base that they have in the country. And, and these are the offerings uh, that we also do with this, uh, but focusing primarily on discipline uh, and, 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 and making sure that uh, the youth will leave uh, the camps clearly understanding what they need to do. The fourth phase is on the actual skills development now. So all the, the last two phases, even though it's been training, but it's been brought in making sure that we mold our youth and make them ready uh, to be the agents of change. But the actual content now of the skills development, as I said, based on our DDM approach, based on that special analysis that we've conducted, making sure we understand exactly what you will do uh, once you are trained. So you're training, we're training you for the purpose. This way now we're building capacity. If you, where you're coming from, there is an opportunity for soya bean production and the entire value chain of that. We therefore will be designing specific costs with our partners through our TV colleges and our, some of our institutions like your Agricultural Research Council that provides a number of training. We will design a soya bean, I'm making an example, course for you and make sure that you are uh, well, invested with the ins and out of that commodity, but also will provide the support, as I said, uh, once, you, once you finish that, uh, the training. We also introduced this, which is compulsory, and this is a community service uh, that we make sure that our youth participate in, in a community service as, as they train to try and, and, and give back to, to, to the community. We manage this uh, keeping logbooks on what youth is doing in relation to what they've been trained, also trying to pass on the knowledge uh, to, to, other, to other community members within the space. This then uh, tries at a high level, provide that synopsis overview of just what I was trying to explain in this very few minutes I'm given by Dr. Susan Dombella, uh, that we look at the character building and leadership as I said, the Department of Defense and the Induction, Active Citizenry, Life Skills and Career Development, and overall youth development, that's the phase. We, we move over to the specific skills that we then train you on uh, using various TVET colleges, actual colleges, and our entities that we have uh, to provide all the related uh, 
training that you need bias towards the sector, but not only uh, completely limited to it, given that rural development is indeed a multi-sectoral and that not every youth would want to be uh, in, in directly primary production, but we give priority to those that are still having a direct linkage to, to the sector. Uh, Dirigent of uh, spoke about access to land because whatever we're training on, you need access to land. Uh, in consultation with COPTA and our traditional institutions, we therefore look for land assisted by our land reform uh, programs that uh, Dirigent of uh, outlined earlier on. And then from there, we, we do a startup packages that we now move you uh, towards that incubation of the business, what exactly would be the costing of it, what uh, on support training you will require for you now to develop this entrepreneurship uh, skills you need. Uh, and then we move into the implementation, uh, providing funding, uh, not only on the NARSEC program only, uh, Elder just uh, listed few of the support. We tap in in all of those programs. Say so now here's a youth has been trained, uh, uh, we need some support. Uh, they qualify under the planning funding, funding. They qualify under cast, or they qualify from the enterprise development and all whatever we have, including what we do in in the rural space, which is uh, providing infrastructure uh, to make sure that uh, the work that we do is, is supported. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, chair, and then I won't go through. Uh, to the details on the infrastructure, just to indicate that uh, we are providing a production infrastructure for the sector. Uh, things like your fencing, your for animal and felt management programs, your tipping tanks, your pack houses. We look at uh, maximizing the available water resources in the country by uh, providing both the park and on field irrigation infrastructure. Uh, working that together with uh, colleagues in the provinces. We provide uh, through the Agriparks program, uh, a one service stop center where all farmers can come together and we provide uh, the pack houses uh, through our colleagues uh, from EDTM, which is our enterprise development. They provide mechanization. We build infrastructure for those to ensure that they're properly stored and all of that. Uh, Chair, I will uh, stop here so that we have time for, for, for questions. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and 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 respond when necessary. I I thank you very much. Thank you very much, and uh, that Makolo. That was helpful. We have learned from the land side. We have learned from the programs on the credit and finance. We have learned on the skills and infrastructure. Let's hear the last um, engagement on the government side. We will we'll be talking about the market side, and then we move on to the reflections from the youth and the live experiences. May I then um, uh, uh, invite Ndatem Somi to come in. I will put the presentation up. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ndombela. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the, uh, assisting me with the presentation. We have uh, last week, um, on Friday, the minister hosted a food systems uh, a workshop, which looked at the challenges that we have that uh, as a country, we are producing so much food, as you can see. But the challenge is that uh, we have got many people that are actually food insecure. So we want to, through this presentation, to delve into the challenges and also to look how do we use the SHEP approach to unlock these food challenges. Thank you for that. We'll just go to the next slide. The next slide is just, uh, we define what is food security. A couple of slides on, on explaining the challenges. Then we go into the shep as a solution to this uh, food systems challenge so that we can produce food and consume it locally. Uh, I think that's we we'll take care of that. Then we, we conclude with the conclusion. Then when we define uh, food security, we define food security as a state where all people at all times have physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food to meet their dietary needs and their food preferences. There are four marketers of this. First is food access, which is measured through 
affordability, allocation preference is a very complex concept. It's difficult to measure and evaluate. The second one is the food availability, where we produce it, distribute and marketing. And then third one is stability, that once we have food, we need to have it over time. Thirdly is the food utilization, so that we have a food of value, it is safe, and uh, is, uh, it helps with nutrition. And the, and the COVID-19 pandemic has actually made the situation worse of the people that didn't have food. Thank you, next slide. The next slide, it looks at the challenges. Uh, if you look at the first year, there were some red arrows which have just disappeared now from 2011 uh, to 2015. It's a red slide. We see an increasing uh, in number of um, uh, people uh, who, who are hungry from 13 million to 14 million. That was at the pinnacle of the drought. Then uh, in 2015, after the drought, we still stabilizing, as we see in amber. But lastly, in the 2018 to 2019, uh, the arrow there should be green, which means then that uh, what is happening is going down. So you'll see it, it jumped from 13.67 to 11.39. But out of the population of 60 million South Africans who live or people who live in South Africa, 11.39 million is still close to 20%. This is a one to me. This is the challenges of a, a country that export food. We exported 10.2 billion worth of food last uh, uh, calendar year. So we cannot have such a problem. This next slide also deals uh, with the food utilization. Uh, the problem that we have now people with increasing incomes, we've got overweight and obesity, uh, which have reached epidemic uh, 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 proportions. This is from our South African National Health and Nutrition Examination, which is held every four years. So if you compare the one in 2012 and 2016, you see that we have regressed from 26 to 27% in terms of children under five, which are wasting and are standard. The, the ones that are, are wasting are from 2.2 to 3. And then the obesity for men, uh, you find that uh, it's 31% for men in state form. So the take home here is that um, uh, through the food, uh, people have sedentary lifestyles, they're not active, they're watching TV, they are not actually working in their gardens. And then you have got heart disease, diabetes, AP and some certain cancers because we are now we've changed our diet to energy dense diets like high in refined starches sugar that's why we have got the sugar tax to try and lower that we've got fats salts if we have our ships processed food and meat so this becomes a problem now here is the solution the solution is the smallholder uh, empowerment solution, uh, uh, promotion. Uh, this is a, a SHEP. Uh, it's a market-oriented agriculture promotion. This approach is aimed at increasing the farmer's income. Uh, this means that uh, farmers must farm as a business. It means then farmers must grow to sell, not that farmers must grow and look for the market. So I remember that uh, during the webinar, that the minister hosted on, uh, on SHEP. There was a farmer from Talton said, I want to go and sell food, uh, uh, my produce in Soweto. So this shows how the farmer actually must be able to attain that. Next slide. Uh, the objectives of SHEP is to empower smallholder producers to, pre to pursue market-oriented agriculture, uh, it capacitate capacitate them to undertake farming as a business by imparting necessary marketing and production skills. So you first study the market, then you'll also be able to come back and produce both livestock and crops. It emphasizes the importance of being autonomous. 
and uh, so that you, which is a very self uh, uh, ingredient, which means you, you need to be self reliant and sustainable. Uh, it encourages farmers to work in groups to address challenges of the market and the paradigm shift that you actually grow and sell. You used to when you pass by a, a community garden, you hear a smell of rotting cabbages. Now, before you start to do anything, you need to go and check your market to get to know what is it. So this chap is used for farmers because it uplift, farmers uplifted through market-oriented agriculture and their livelihoods are improved because they improve their income. Farmers become self-reliant and the creative in expanding their farming businesses. They look for many markets. It enhances their capacity and small the place to pass effectively in the market oriented agriculture. The next slide shows the shape activities. There are four steps that are important. You select a uh, selection of the targets uh, of the farmers who have, who have got the same goals. Then we do sensitization workshops. They understand what do they want. Then the uh, selection of the, the target group. The second step is farmers' awareness uh, of their current situation, the resources that they have, the land that they have, so that the, the, there's a participatory baseline survey, then they go out and do the market survey themselves. Number three is a decision making by the farmers, then they can uh, do a product selection, whether it's egg production, whether they want to sell a beef or they want to sell a martin, or then they have a production calendar. Uh, number four is the provision of a tinker solution, that's where our extension and other services comes in making understandable guidelines and extension material to farmers, then that's when we deal with infield uh, training. The next slide then it help, uh, takes us, summarizes that you need to know your market, then you come back, you plan your activities, then you grow your crops or livestock production, then you, you, you take it to your market. Then there's a communication between you and your market. You tell them every two weeks, my produce is coming, so that the market, they are aware when they are going to, they can get from farmer A, then they are going to get from farmer B. Uh, next slide, please, yeah. Then the next slide now, this is the uh, uh, diagrammatic expression. How do we promote the farming as a business? We are sharing information among the market actors and the farmers on their side. Uh, but the market actors, they are going to say uh, what uh, variety, the price, uh, when do we want the product? The farmer then, as I said, every two weeks, the farmer's location says, I'm so far away from the shop. This is what I'm producing. This is the amount I'm going to produce, etc." On the other side, raising the internal motivation for continuous activities for employment. We have for this self-determination theory. We want farmers to become autonomous uh, so that they are competent and then they can relate to others then they will adapt to the grow to sell. The next slide uh, also summarizes this one. Uh, you can look at, uh, 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 at Desi and Rien's self-determination theory. Competence means I can do it. I'm an able person, autonomy. I make my own decision. I have ownership. That's what this uh, shape imparts uh, those uh, confidence in the farmers and then you can say I'm part of that uh, group. Then um, what we have done so far, over 340 extension practitioners have been trained in CHEP. So in all districts, we've got about 60 districts, we've got 2,500 extension practitioners. So far, 1,541 smallholders are benefiting from CHEP approach in South Africa. The minister and the MECs and heads of department have hosted nine CHEP in all languages to explain out of those webinars, 5,792 farmers participated at the webinars. And then this was also broadcast live to community radio stations and Facebook that like we are doing now. The SHEP training uh, is done in provinces, still continuing. We are getting more extension practitioners and farmers uh, being brought on. Uh, the SHEP, um, this is a, a program that we do with the Japanese International Cooperation Agency and the provinces have developed a, a program that actually guides how these things are done. Farmers are encouraged to approach their provincial district offices. I mean, the youth here, 
to be able to access the different programs offered by the search, including his SHEP approach, the program above by my other colleagues, and also this one. The department is targeting 1 million farmers who will be implementing SHEP, meaning uh, participating in this market so that they can produce food locally, the local markets with your vendors, spaza shops, your chain uh, uh, market chains, so that you are able uh, to, to make sure you take advantage of this. And as we say, 50% of this must be women and 50% of the 1 million farmers should be used. In conclusion then, uh, what we can say is that the SHEP approach is one of the approaches that is used to support farmers in South Africa. The approach is sponsored by the Japanese International Cooperation Agency, and it doesn't offer material support per se, but farmers, they learn through field training, how to study and deal with the market. They also learn how to deal with the aspect of the production and feed as well our extension practitioners. They assist them so that they can actually produce a good quality food, tomatoes, safe food that meets the market requirements. The approach is if adopted by all extension practitioners, the 2,500 and all the prospective youth farmers, it will mitigate the wastage because uh, the 37 percent of the food is wasted. So then we'll be able to produce food locally and they'll be able to have food available uh, so that we don't have spinach coming all the way uh, from the other areas when we have got the garden that is lying fallow. The rollout of the approach will ensure that farmers communicate on their own and they go to the market because they, they've got that uh, independence. They can now go and negotiate it themselves. I think that's all that uh, the last slide is just a thank you slide. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mdati. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Somme, and thank you very much to also all the senior government that presented to us. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to that part of our program where we actually now ask the government official, the minister is still with us, um, where we now take it into the youth so that they can be able to provide insight in terms of this program, whether they are talking and they are designed in a manner that address their challenges they face at the grassroots level. And also, this is a golden opportunity, I think, for the youth, if, as we said in the beginning from the minister as well, that. The department is currently at the planning phase, which means it's a fertile and opportune time to provide the specific programs and the specific need that the youth will want to see coming from their government in ensuring that it assists them. The minister and the department, they're currently in the planning phase in two very critical policy documents where they are busy developing and finalizing the master plan, which will be the blueprint of the department and how the resources of the department will be allocated both at the national and provincial level. But more importantly, as we just also heard from Mr. Msome, is that the minister preparing the position of the country as part of the United Nations food systems of how we ensure we transform our food system and ensure nobody is left behind in having access into safe and nutritional food. So this will certainly then be most important as we allow the youth to get in and be able to inform their department to say how they see or what is their live experience in terms of contributing into the agriculture economy. Let me then allow um, to, as we start getting the perspective of the youth and how can they transform the agriculture and grow our food system. Let me start off with our invited panelists. We have Ms. Komahele Bombe and we have Ms. Nkosa Namdambo and Mr. Ndumiso Gule, who will sort of give us their perspective. And as soon as they, they finish, I would like to open up the floor where we will also have an opportunity to provide your live experiences and your perspective of how can we really encourage the youth in participating in this agriculture. Ladies and gentlemen, let me then allow Ms. Bombe to take the floor. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, Program Director. A very good morning to uh, Minister Togo Didiza, government officials and young people who joined this amazing discussion. 
My name is Kamahela Bombe. I'm a 28-year-old poultry farmer. My journey started in 2013 as a middleman. I mean, when I moved to Gauteng, I realized that, you know, as much as I am very passionate about agriculture, land was a big problem. I mean, I grew up in, I was born in, and I grew up in Limpopo. My grandmother used to work for the biggest tomato producers in the Southern Hemisphere, which is ZZ2. And in that, I mean, she also had a, a garden where she grew her own cash crops. And I saw how she made money out of agriculture. And it was, you know, really interesting. But when I moved to Gauteng, I started looking for land uh, with no like. So I then decided to come up with ways for me to still continue uh, fulfilling my passion, which is agriculture. I then decided to become a middleman. So what I did is I drove to Zirbekom, which is in the Western area. Um, I met with farmers who farm poultry. Um, I then decided to start a business called Sishebo Combo. So what I did then was to buy broiler chickens, which are chickens that are raised for meat, and eggs and acha. And my, my, my market was Abokoko Wemdende. So I used to do those combos and sell to them and collect money um, month end, you know, just so that I can understand how the poultry um, uh, um, uh, industry works and also, you know, get to secure the market so that when I get a farm, I know that I've got a secured market. Then in 2014, I then decided to do a three-day poultry um, workshop. I attended a poultry workshop in Brakpani just so that I can get the insights of what chicken farming is. And then from there, went back to Zerbekom. Um, I then rented a broiler house. I started with 2,500 broilers. Biggest mistake I've ever done. Uh, because, I mean, you know, as, a, as, as someone who was new in the poultry industry, I realized that starting big really killed me because mortality was very high. And so there's so many things that you need to consider, especially if you really want to grow broilers. Um, the environment is very important where you're growing your broilers. I mean, the farm that I was renting was next to a railway station. And broilers being so sensitive, my mortality was so high that I remember I lost 120 in the first cycle. That demotivated me that I decided to stop. And then in 2015, former mayor of City of Johannesburg, Pax Dau, Dr. Pax Dau, um, then launched an agri-park um, for women and young people who are interested in agriculture. I saw the ad on the newspaper, I then applied and I was allocated a hectare. Um, so when I moved to Ekenov, I then decided to do layers, which are chickens that are raised to lay eggs. And I think it was just, it's a great initiative. I mean, agri-parks, and I think every municipality has an agri-park. An agri um, and I think it helps young people who want to get into agriculture but who don't have land. I also believe that, you know, with these agri parks, it's it's a great platform for small scale farmers to make mistakes and learn from 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 that. You know, um I I, I was I, I was part of the agri park for three years. And then I decided to host workshops because, you know, I was getting a lot of DMs from young people who were saying we want to get into poultry farming, but we don't know where to start. So I started hosting workshops in 2016 just to give insights of what poultry farming is. And in that, I then realized that, you know, as much as um, young people want to get, get into agriculture, there is so many opportunities that are there within the agricultural space. So what I did, what I did for myself was I then decided to attend a butchery and meat processing course so that I can understand the whole value chain. So that as a small scale farm, I think it, that is very important. If you are able to grow your own chickens, slaughter them, have a mini abattoir, a mini abattoir is a slaughterhouse and then make products out of whatever that you produce. So it helps you to, to cut costs so you know that you grow. And especially as a small, as, as a small scale farmer, uh, if really you get a contract, say, with a certain retailer and they want you to, pro, to supply them rather with 500 beds weekly, for you to get a contract with an abattoir to slaughter those chickens, for you, to be honest, it is a hassle. So I would advise that you build your mini abattoir. I know that, you know, challenges that are really faced by 
farmers currently um, access to training. I mean, I don't have a certificate in being in owning an abattoir. I've been looking for one. That's why I decided to do the uh, a butcher and meat processing course. And 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 in light of, of that. I always say to young people, if really you want to get into agriculture, as a small scale farmer, you shouldn't, you shouldn't worry about supplying these big retails. And I'll tell you the disadvantage of supplying big retails as a small scale, scale farmer. One, the issue, uh, the issue of compliance. The first thing that they need is an EIA. As an as a, as a, as a emerging farmer, do you understand what an EIA is? A EIA is an environmental access. Um, environmental impact assessment. That's a certificate that talks about how will um, these chickens affect, you know, you know the, the, the surroundings, how will it affect uh, the, the other animals, how will it affect the plants? So in order for you to get that EIA, you need about 300,000. Do you have the 300,000 as a small scale? No, you don't. So the, your pick and pace will definitely want that. They will want a certificate from the abattoir to say who is slaughtering for you. Um, is the abattoir certified? Um, is their truck working properly? They also need a truck certificate from the abattoir. Will you be able to convince um, that white um, owner who owns an abattoir to say, I've got this contract, this is what I need from you? Chances are you might, chances are you, you might not, because of with these big abattoirs, they slaughter about 50,000. Uh, bits a day you know so i mean when if you're talking about 500 if to them it doesn't make business sense so that's why i'm saying that if as young people who are innovative within the agricultural space that as a, as a small scale farmer you do the whole value chain it works for you and not for now um i'm not so excited about um supplying supplying these big retails as a small scale because of simply compliance there's so much that they need they need um you to be um um things certified by the uh, sab they need so many things branding and as a small scale farmer i mean you're not really making a lot of money so you can imagine that you are you are wasting money on transport this abattoir and branding as well so for me as a small scale farmer to be honest with you if you, you you're doing eggs your market is your bakeries around around your your community I mean, if you use bakeries around Soweto, um well, my friend that is your market um, small butcheries, stock fells, and pieces, ESCOM issue. A lot of people really, what they do is, if there is no electricity, if you have realized when you drive around these townships, one of these guys who have started, I call them corner restaurants, they sell chicken dust. As a broiler farmer, that is your market. So I just think that as farmers, especially small scale farmers, we need to be innovative within the agricultural space. I still believe that as you start, you don't really need a big land. You can start with backyard farming. I mean, I visited a group of young people in the in Cape Town last week, and then they were telling me about food systems, how they work. You know, and um, they they approached office um, parks to give them space minutes, so that ahead. okay, so that they can grow their uh, their their produce, and they supply the restaurant in the um, waterfront. They also su supply canteens within these um, uh, office parks. So for me, as young people, really, we can. Go on and on and, and, and saying government needs to help us with market. But we're nice young people, we need to be innovative. We need to come up with ways that can make farming easy and attractive. Technology. I'm not an IT specialist, but I still believe that if you're an IT specialist, you can come up with an app, app that can help young people to farm. There's a friend of mine, Bali, she uses an app to, to manage her farm. She knows today, but how much water does she need? So there is so many ways. We just need to be creative. And when we approach government and say, this is what I have, can you be able to help me? And it makes things easy. I still believe that if there's one thing that can help with our economy, is that agriculture, there's so many things that can be done. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think that was very powerful and very exciting to hear. And also the challenge that you're posing amongst the young people and all those different um, markets and localization of food. I think that was very exciting. And Kosan, let me ask you, sir, to join us. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much uh, to the Honorable Minister Togo Zile Titiza. Uh, 
to the government officials who has presented, thank you very much. And to my colleagues, fellow farmers, food security people, thank you very much. And Gosana Mdambo is an Eastern First Aid farmer uh, who is only 27 years old, started this operational farming in 2014. Uh, I'm operating as a Mdambo Bordere. It's situated here in the Friede, that is well known. Uh, well, most people will notice Friede with the Friede dairy, but Gosana Mdambo is trading aside. Uh, well, one of the fundamental challenges that has been an uh, obstacle, or maybe the, the, the problem that we have been facing as young farmers, uh, it's, it's the red tape within the industry. One of the fundamental, it's the red tape, it's the middlemen that we encounter problems with, the mark, access to market, access to funding. When I started farming, I started farming at the age of 21, whereby I was given the farm as a birthday gift of my 21st birthday in 2014. And while I would say it wasn't been an easy journey because you to understand I'm from the city and then I had to come and start farming. But farming has been something I've loved because my grandfather was a farmer and he still, he still is a farmer. So when they bought me a farm, I had no knowledge. I came in with my blank knowledge, but I was also into, I'm from a business family whereby I was groomed in terms of, far, in terms of making money. And then when I got in, I made farming a business. I didn't say farming as an operationally or a hobby. I made it a business because when I got in, I had only 20 head of cattle. Then if you to check now, you'll be shocked because uh, I got in from my high school, then I got in, started working, uh, went abroad uh, in Indonesia, Jakarta, did my agro-processing training there, and then I had to drop out because of I felt that I can do much better than what they've been teaching there. So as part of today, the minister has invited us uh, as young people. I think uh, we must get one thing straight first before. I heard the previous speakers saying that Young people are the futures of, or the leaders of tomorrow. We are not the leaders of tomorrow. One thing we must get straight firstly is that some of us are leading at this young age. We should be granted chances to lead because we have the capabilities. I still emphasize and say this, uh, agriculture is a solution to unemployment in South Africa. I saw the rate is very high of unemployment. We are the people who can eradicate unemployment. First and foremost, if we can push hashtags, things like one household, one garden, one household, one food garden. If minister, we can have such initiatives. I'm well aware by my dad telling me that when they were young, they used to have food gardens in their house, backyard. So if we can push this thing, this hashtag, indeed will go somewhere. This other initiative that we have started doing here in the side of Eastern Free State in Pumelela, it's inventing in investing in primary schools. If you start this, bring back agriculture at schools, you know, that does a say that says, teach me how to catch a fish, don't give me a fish. The problem that we do is that we give these people food parcels. We give these people, we, we give these people 350 rands. Why don't we empower these people and say that here are a seed pack, here's a, a water can, go and start your own food garden. The best garden winner will win a certain price. Empower people. That's why we're saying that at the young age, primary level, we must, must at school bring back agriculture. Agriculture is one of the, it's a solution actually to the unemployment poverty. And I want to say one thing as us in the agri and private sector, when I got into the farming industry, I told myself I don't need any funding because I believe that most people who were funded in the previous, I read about people who were funded. Most of them never made it or most of them didn't. Uh, they were just funded, things dilapidated, mm -hmm. buildings were there, gone. But what I've realized about funding, it will make you relax. It will make you not become a, a, a innovative in a form that you rely on it. So one thing that I've noticed is that at this point of stage, funding is a, it's, it's, it's a need as a young farmer, but one challenge is uh, you get these types of funding, you get funded once in a lifetime, and then farming in farming, you need uh, but what you call it, uh, consistent, consistent funding, because once you get funding once off, this is farming, it's, uh, it's on and off. I'm a crop and livestock farmer. Currently, I've, plant, I've started planting my uh, crops from 2018. Remember 2018 was one of the year with droughts in the Eastern Free State. And then I had a problem because that was my first year of planting and mm -hmm. then I lost. I never gave up. My second year I came through, I could harvest better. 
Now I came to a point whereby I say that uh, we must cut the middlemen. How do you cut the middlemen? I sat down with my team because I'm farming with young people. 75% of my farm workers are young people. I'm trying to mix skills with education, with experience within my farm. That's why we farming, we say we farming, we're doing farming fashionable. Now, what we did is that we decided to open a milling company, which is still under uh, which is under construction right now. We say that we want to take from our farm the maize to our own milling company because you to understand the red tape as a young person, you don't have funds. The bank is pushing you to pay them to pay them back the loan. So that's why we said no. We're going to open market for the people who are also farming, young people or people from different regions and say to them, here's a Kinako super maize meal. It's a young owned black farmer. Come and bring your own maize. We promise not to take a lot of, we don't We don't have this lot of unnecessary touched by these uh, so-called co-ops that we have because of desperation. Now we have sat down and said, no, we will call on the market. Now we are looking and saying, in the beef industry, what is the other problem that we are facing? We say we also have a middleman problem. That is the fundamental problem that we also have. It. You get your beef to order, you get your winner's kettles into order. And then you realize later on, when you go and sell them, they don't sell at that value we're looking at. Another it's the, 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 racial, the racial problem within this industry. We must get it straightened and we must change the concept that a certain race must, must benefit better or certain race must be. And the attention of us young people, we realize that we are getting attention only when it's youth month. We, we plead with you that minister, can we not get attention only when it's youth month? Can we get attention throughout the year? Because now that's become something that we say after this month, we are done with the youth, we'll see them next year. The previous speakers who were speaking here, they've presented so, so nice programs. But to me, it sounded like some foreign programs because of our agricultural department within the provincial, they are not so advanced uh, within the fourth industrial revolution technology, whereby they can advertise these, these kind of initiatives like your, sh your shape, uh, this initiative that there's funding source, you can source funding in, a, in this kind of manner. So we want to challenge and say to the honorable minister, can you improve the technology within our agricultural uh, offices within the provincials and within the regions so that we can get better information and informative. And as, as young people, we want to say that we, we can push this thing because social media is a very powerful tool that we, we, we can use to, to mobilize this, uh, this, this initiative. Now, one of, one of, one of the key issues my, my previous farmer has also, 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 also I, I highlighted is that uh, within, within us as young people, we need to engage as much as possible because you to find that uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, the coming upcoming speaker, maybe he has a solution of my problem that I'm encountering within the farms. And then I know one of the fundamental problems too within young farmers is access to land, uh, land because I'm also a farmer that's having problem with the land. I'm restricted to grow at my own land because of the small land capacity that I have, because I want to grow, but the problem I'm restricted, the channels of getting land also must be looked into because you to find that you have to get land at the certain requirements. Some of the requirements, some of us don't have them. Some of the young people don't have them, you understand? So, so, so you to check that we must push as much as we can that the access to your offices, the access to your life, because if, even now I can challenge the minister and call one of our provincial offices. You struggle to get hold of the officials. It's either you drive to that official place to get hold of them, or you either, I don't know, yes, it's COVID, but there must be a formula of communication that is much better uh, uh, within within our, our our agricultural sectors. And I thank you, I thank you, Chair. Th th thank you very much, Ambassador. Minister, I think it's coming very clear, Minister, to as well as the senior officials. I think it's coming very clear that there's a need of a youth platform where they can be able to uh, engage and, and continue to have this. Uh, bilateral engagement with the, with, the, with the department and the other agricultural other organs of state. I think, Minister, there's also uh, coming up very clear that there is a need to ensure that we improve efficiency 
of government system and communication of these programs, uh, and also ensuring that you uplift the capacity um, and the, the reduce the red tape at provincial level. Those are some of the things, Minister, and to the senior government that are actually coming up within the youth, and hopefully you will find some space to reflect on them. May I then ask Mr. Kule to come in and also provide us with some insight. Thank you. Good day to everyone. Good day to you, Minister. Good day to the panelists. Good day to everyone that is available today and attending this webinar. My name is Dumiso Kule. I would like to first share with you who I am. I grew up in Ladysmith in the rural areas. I went to school in the rural areas. And from there, I have worked at uh, Bainesville uh, Training Academy, which was for training uh, people to, to, to know how to raise pigs, breed pigs and all that. I left there and I worked for Veterinary, veterinary House Hospital. Uh, then thereafter, I worked at Sparing Cattle Feedlot Company. And then from there, I worked for MSD Animal Health. Um, then since then, I have been working at Bainesfield Estate as, um, as a beef head manager, where I look after 1,500 breeding cow head. Um, this year, I was awarded an award as a beef master farmer of the month of February, recognized by Beef Master Feedlot. And uh, parallel to all this, for the last seven years, I have been consulting on a part-time basis. And um, throughout consulting and traveling, I've consulted in KwaZulu Natal, Eastern Cape, Free State, uh, Houting. And everything and anything that I'm about to talk to you, Minister, about today is based on the observations that I have seen in my travel. All black farmers of sort. These are communal farmers. These are emerging farmers and also commercial farmers as follow. We've noticed that uh, we've got quite a poor quality of animals that are raised around on the farms and the conception rates going through all to the weaning rate of either sheep, cattle or goats are as low as 40%. And on the commercial black farmers, the average we see is 65%, which is still poor. This has resulted in the low income, which, which leads to low profit margins for these operations, whether it's communal or imaging or commercial. We've seen the government doing a good job in funding people that want to start feedlots. And when we see these feedlots, these feedlots are standing way below capacity. Some of them are standing at 20% capacity at most, and some of them are empty. And the challenge with that is that the people that have got good in intentions to start feeding cattle, when they go to the sales, they, 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 they compete for a winner. They compete for a lamb against uh, bigger setups. We'll talk about the solutions to that later. We've seen devastating diseases in these areas. The biggest thief of livestock or in livestock is not, is not human beings. Its name is, is called trike and vibrio. There's so many calves that are lost by farmers before they are even born because animals are bought due to these diseases. And the spread of trike in these areas is caused by poor management systems that are not being put in place. And we've seen now what's currently happening with the pig industry, that swine fever. Uh, we've all seen the documentary on, on Cut Blanche where, where farmers were losing pigs left, right and center. It's all got to do with management, Minister. And one biggest challenge is that, if I can be political, 
is that the apartheid system was created so well, so well in that our parents and our, fa our fathers, our grandfathers uh, decided that our children will not be starting farming and all that. So quite, there are two generations of, of black people that have been taken away from starting towards farming. And we, the youth of today, are the front runners with the knowledge and the experience and the capacity to assist in livestock development, in livestock production and crop production. So noticing this minister, and I have been wanting farm myself to own a farm and be a farm and operate with, with the amount of experience and knowledge that I have, uh, I've been let down by the system where I haven't to this day um, managed to obtain a farm. So what then I did, I sat down and I thought, okay, I can't get a farm. Um, but what I can do is share my knowledge and experience to people that have been given farms and get their operations to be formal, put production systems in place for those operations to make profit so that they can be sustainably run and continue to employ people. So then I started a consulting firm called Gule Agri Consulting. And with that, we've been consulting wherever you are in the province, if you are willing to pay for a traveling fee, we are there and we will help, help you set up your, your farm, put together the enterprise combinations, and we look at the figures. What does it take for that particular um, enterprise to make profit? What does your farm has, have? What are the natural competitive advantages that your farm presents? How can you capitalize on them sustainably? So, and with us having 12 years in working, and this is post uh, starting at, 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 at Sidara, uh, we have seen and realized that, you know, information read from the book only provides, provides you the basics and the base for you to be able to interpret things because environments change from here to, to, to up to, 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 to the north. <clears throat> now we have, Minister, formulated a project or a plan or a livestock development plan, which we wish to implement so that we provide solutions uh, on the livestock production and crop side. These feedlots that are under capacity, they need winners. The farmers in commercial sector, emerging sector and communal farmers, we have created a genetic transformation plan which will improve animal performance, animal selection as per environment dictate and not wiping out indigenous breeds or adaptable breeds. We are just improving those, those, those animals in those areas so that we can afford our people an opportunity to present or raise a good quality calf. If I can use beef as an example, what's currently happening, your communal farmers, emerging farmers and, and, and commercial farmers, black farmers, they take their animals to the sales and they get paid about 1,700 less per animal purely because of the quality of the animal. And this is just a genetic makeup. Our plan will address that and allow these people to produce a top quality calf that will be channeled to these feedlots that the government has built. And these feedlots will feed these animals at full capacity. And when I say full capacity, not designing feedlots that are taking 500 animals standing at any one time because we are dodging the fact that we have to do an EIA. We need to do an EIA and we establish our feedlots to be a minimum of 1,200 animals standing because that makes a financial sense. We make profit when we're sitting at that minimum number. Then we'll have sustainability today. All those animals will be going out every week to be slaughtered at this black owned abattoirs. 
And these black abattoirs have an opportunity to upgrade their facilities and apply for a license to export, then they will participate in that. By doing this, Minister, we will have created a full black owned livestock or beef value chain where, where our communal farmers are producing quality animals. And your department, uh, in case that end has done a very good job in creating structures, communication structures where there they are deep tanks. As a matter in case that end, there are 2,053 deep tanks and there are 50 livestock association committees that we communicate through. Now imagine this in your head. We've got two, three, four deep tanks that pull animals together. And we know that in April, May, it's winning time. They bring all their winners to a facility. The truck is loaded and the animals go out straight to a black owned feedlot. From there to a black owned abattoir and then export or local consumption. So then on the crop side, we've noticed that over and above your department offering a mechanization program, but we feel that we can make an improvement in in, 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 in soil correction, because for every crop that is planted, we need to make sure that the soil is nutritionally balanced, is corrected, the taking of soil samples, adding of lime, and, and putting down of that fertility, uh, fertilizer or those minerals that are short. So that concept called precision farming, we need to adopt that as black farmers so that we increase yield of maize and all that maize can be channeled through to these feedlots to be, to, to be utilized. So we create our own value chain in that way. And I- uh, two, two minutes in the middle. Thank you. And in, 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 in the message that I have for the youth is that we as the young people need to know what it takes to succeed. And the request to the government is that, could you please review the process that you are using to award farms? Can you use experience and knowledge rather than the assets? Because us as previously disadvantaged people, we don't really have much assets to show. And in closing, I would say, the future is now, Minister. And without a quality livestock winner or lamb, or piglet winner, there is no meat value chain. And we need to invest in our farmers to produce winners, and we have that capacity. And in order for the master plan to work, we need to develop winners. Thank you for the opportunity you've given me today to talk to you. Thank you very much, Ndomiso. That was very mouthful and that was very helpful. I think Minister did a call to go beyond those programs that also deal with animal improvement and also uh, very practical um, initiatives that are driving the utilization of some of the assets that we have procured in rural areas using those feedlots. I think Minister, that was very uh, good a message coming from Domiso to you. May I then um, open up a floor? I would like to see by show of hands if I can take uh, two or three hands, then I would like to uh, and, um, and, um, invite the minister to come and reflect on some of the engagements that the youth are seeing. Before I recognize some hands, minister, on the, uh, on the commentary sections, there are um, in attendance, some of those that are in the Northern Cape working with the military veterans, where they are calling for assistance in terms of getting access into the institutional markets where they are looking for um, intervention if they could get those recognition and letter of intent into the institutional markets. We'll provide the comments and which, which department, which officials within the department you can engage on that part. Minister, there's also some suggestion on the commentary section where some of the youth are saying, if government can consider either subsidizing the AIAs as one of the crippling cost that uh, inhibit the entry by the youth in the agriculture sector. 
will continue to be reading your comments. And also those that couldn't join us, we are available in all social media platforms of the department. You can follow the conversation there. I see there's a lot of hands. May I then uh, take the hand of Fortunate? I also see the hand of Noma Temba Langa um, and, and then the hands of Koke Tzomoloko. Let me take those three for now. Thank you very much. If you could keep it brief so that we can also afford opportunities to other one will be great. Thank you. Fortunate, the opportunity is yours. Okay, that seems to have lost Fortunate. Uh, Minister, I see your hand is up. Um, can I recognize you before I take the number timber? I think take number timber, I'll come back uh, when I respond. Okay. Uh, number timber, can I then offer you an opportunity? Noma Temba, are you able to take the floor? All right, let's go to Koketo Moloko. Koketo? Okay, we seem to probably having some challenges connecting with the audience. Minister, let me give to you an opportunity and we'll try again to connect with our attendees as we uh, patiently wait for their insight. Hello? Yes, Koketo, you can go yes, on. Sorry, sorry Minister. You yes. were just oh, Go time. ahead, Koketo. Okay, yeah, apologies for that. Um, no, I'll just read out the, the uh, well, good afternoon to everyone, and I'll just read out the, the, the message I posted in the chat. Um, my message reads as follows. It says, good afternoon to the panelists. Is there any, is there a possibility that emerging farmers could get an exemption uh, for environmental impact assessments and water rights, just as farmers with historical rights were recognized under the new dispensation? Uh, furthermore, I say as emerging farmers, the money spent for this licensing is financially crippling to startup enterprises. Uh, infrastructure financing on communal land is also a challenge for us as funders often want title deeds as surety. How can we solve these two problems? Uh, regards Koketo Moloko, I'm a crop, a livestock and vegetable farmer for LMC Food Group and I'm based in Molute City in the Northwest. Thank you. Thank you very much for that Koketo. Um, we'll continue also monitoring all those other charts. Uh, Minister, let me take it to you then. No, thank you very much. Um, so I think the panelists, uh, young people have actually raised very important issues about how our systems respond to young people. And I must assure them that we've taken that to heart and look at how we actually resolve it. But there's, uh, I'm not sure whether one delay is here so that we can talk to market access issues and uh, be able to have a fuller conversation because it has also arisen from what some of these young people have uh, raised, particularly Kamuhelo, when she was sharing her experience on how we could actually, even at a small scale level, participate in the entirety of the value chain. I see I've got uh, two, I don't know how I'm appearing twice in the platform, and I see the new minister, Didiza, who is a young man there. For that, let's hope that the IT will assist us. As, yes, Minister, I see that you have changed your picture into a young man there. Um, hopefully, they will assist us. Minister, uh, uh, Wandile is with us um, and is ready to take us through and some of the uh, insight on the market access and some of the opportunities also for youth in the industry. Um, I, I, while we're trying to just sort out that issue at the background with the minister, 
Mr. Shlobo, can I then give you 15 minutes to just make your presentation and some of the insights you have for us? And then we'll get back into those discussion with the minister as a reflection to what the youth have presented. Thank you. Yeah, um, uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Dombela, and uh, good, good, good afternoon to all the colleagues uh, that are on the call, and uh, good afternoon, Minister, uh, senior colleagues at the department. Uh, I think all protocols are observed. Uh, so I, I had um, I prepared a couple of slides here uh, just to speak about uh, the general health or state of the South African agricultural economy. I hope you could see my slides. But just before getting into that, I mean, I was listening to, to Kamhelo, I listened to, to, to Ngosana, I heard also uh, Ndumi, so, um, and, and in all of the points that they are raising, I mean, and I think that they, they are seeing the issues as they are, they, they, these are the lived experiences that, that they are picking up and bringing to the fore. But now it makes me wonder, uh, in, in our response mechanism, uh, as well as the efficiencies, which what was mentioned firstly, I think it came out on, um, on, on Gosana's point of saying the calibration between the messaging that is coming out of Pretoria, as well as what uh, the farmers on the ground pretty much gets to experience. You, you've also alluded to that point, but I do think that the efficiencies there could, could pretty much be, be, be enhanced. And in, in that same point, and I think the other common theme, and I, and I will get to my slides, but I think these are some of the, the important points that I'm hearing coming from, from the farmers. The, the point around to say, uh, you know, when we think about land reform and the broader developments, um, uh, where is the youth coming up? And I mean, I think the minister in a closing remarks can speak on to this, but I think the, the new uh, beneficiary selection criteria does reflect on the youth. And I think you, you get a, a, a pretty much more preference in there. And I'm commenting Swiss on this point because it dates back from the work that was done by the uh, uh, panel on land reform and agriculture, which was put out, put together by government. And I participated onto that. And the other thing that I think so we will have to look into it, uh, particularly uh, within the, the NMC as well as the colleagues in the government, is this issue that is coming out of Kamhelo's point around the compliance. Um, because it cannot be that now we will have smallholder farmers as well as the emerging youth farmers only participating in certain uh, disaggregated value chains because of the higher, uh, either higher transaction costs or really uh, prohibitive methods of actually being able to join the formal value chain. And I think that there might be a way to say, how do we, while maintaining standards rigorous and health-wise and all the regulations that are needed, but also still be more uh, uh, flexible to, to accommodate the youth to be more involved in that. Because I think the hope is to ensure that South Africa's agricultural sector moves away from the dualistic uh, tenants that we are in, where you have certain people in a small scale farming and certain people in a, in a commercial farming to really come up and to have one food value chain. And I think that all of the colleagues that have spoken from, from Dumiso up until Kamuelo and Kosana, they see all of these challenges that are blocking the integration. And I think what's important is the conversation and the feedback mechanism between us sitting in, in, in Pretoria in these offices that we are in, as well as the colleagues in the real economy, uh, identifying these challenges and seeing how do we best all cope together into this. Because this sector that we are speaking about, Sviso, and, 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 and I think that mechanism of working together is important because this is a growing sector, uh, like these charts that I'm showing in, in the board, for example, really speaks into that. Already last year, we, were, we, we talked about the sector that grew by 13.1%. Um, and if you look at our forecast, as well as from BFEP for this year, we see further growth of between 5% and 7.6%. Now, we should not only be talking about all of these expanding fortunes, while many people feel that they are still sitting on the sideline. We can only imagine now if all of these are uh, hindering factors. Osana mentioned what could be achieved in the beef sector. If all of those were addressed and they were aggregated into this story of expansion, those numbers of growth could be much more better than that. And I think also what I show in the chart on the right-hand side, which is just the agricultural employment, which is just around about 800,000 people, that's the, the, the line that can be turned upside if now uh, is, a, is, is, a, is, a, Kamhelo is, a, is able to find uh, you know, uh, more integration on the commercial chain, the necessary support 
to employ more, more people and expand her operation, there's a lot that can be achieved um, into, into those areas. I, I really think that, that that feedback loop mechanism between us as well as the colleagues on the ground uh, needs to be enhanced um, to achieve those because we do see uh, a growth in the sector, but I think there's a lot of this untapped potential that lies on and it's coming up just uh, listening on to three farmers. Imagine then if we're listening to a number of colleagues uh, that are across the and I think this will add into a story that is already positive about South Africa's agricultural sector. Because with most young people still not integrated in the sector, but by just looking at the people that are already participating in the space, they've seen great expansion. These numbers, for example, that you are seeing on the screen, they're looking at the size uh, of the of the agricultural of the growth of the agricultural sector from 2010 up until uh, 2020 in value terms and in volumes terms. And you will see where growth is actually happening a lot um, in, the in the horticulture space, for example. That's where numbers are, are promising. But generally overall, volumes as well as on the value terms, there's been notable growth in the sector. But now this obviously gets to be meaningless if many other people are feeling that, okay, this is growth that is just happening over there in the commercial space. Uh, but us as young people ways our way onto this. That's another way of looking about it to say, you know, that the story doesn't resonate with all, all of the young people of South Africa. But another way of looking at it is to say, this is meaningful, but now how much could it be if we look at all of the underutilized potential, either on land or either on a human capital on bringing these young people in, those that are already in like the likes of Ngosana uh, uh, to say, how do you enhance what they are already doing? And how do you ensure that Gosana talks to other people in his community that he sees potential on and try to bring them also into the value chain? And then these numbers could pretty much be much more uh, 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 fantastic and not only fantastic in terms of looking at the numbers, but also the, the, the representation in there. Because obviously one of the reality stories that while these numbers are looking this way in agriculture, this is, if you were to look in the racial dynamics, which Lumiso spoke about also, uh, you will see that the participation of, our, of black farmers in all of this growth is still minuscule, somewhere less than 10%. Um, so those are some of the realities that I think that we need to be uh, chatting and having this conversation, but rather also uh, seeing a, a way of responding to these uh, hindrances. And we, 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 we take to either the minister what was alluding to the issue of around the market access stuff. And obviously when it comes to those market access for the medium and small scale farmers and emerging farmers, it will differ value chain by value chain. But I think what is gonna be essential is, is to have that feedback loop mechanism. And then in seeing that, the people that are attempting to go to the re to the former retailer uh, markets or people that are looking at supplying the state institution or people that are want to go into the formal um, uh, value chains, what are some of the, 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 the improvements that can be made both by the government, but also even on us now as agribusinesses? Um, on what can we do to, to respond to some of those things. So I think that's that that's an important point that I see coming up. And I think we should also have those conversations because if we're looking at the numbers, as you and I know, and our colleagues at BFEP and some of our colleagues within the department, when we look at the prospects for the sector, uh, generating our, from our various models, we're all seeing a growth potential for the next decade in South Africa's agricultural sector. But I think that it will not be right if many of the people that are 27, 25 that are on the call are not going to be part of that growth that we are seeing there. Because in terms of the stability of the country and also just in terms of ensuring that this potential of young people is fully utilized, um, is not going to be is, is not going to be a good state. Because those lines that are in that chart, all they are showing is that there's growth that is coming in the sector. But now let's ensure that growth is going to be more inclusive and well representative. And I think all of these various inter in intervention, either on a land reform intervention, but also more on a skill based intervention is one of the menu of options that I think uh, lies on um, in, into addressing those. And I guess, I mean, even if listening uh, to, 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 to to the earlier presentations that came on from our colleagues in, in government, there are already programs 
that aim at uh, 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 integrating the youth in that growth potential going forward. But I think what is lacking now from us now is to ensuring that you know the 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 the, the filtering through of that information from a, to the provincial level and also the municipality level, and also ensuring then that it's not just the information filtering, but also our responsive mechanisms are much more effective in that manner. I think we could be able to see some bit of improvement there. Because what we have lacked, for example, uh, from that story that I showed from 2010 up until now, is that this expansion that we have seen happening in agriculture, which if you look at these just a few crops that I'm showing on the screen here, that has happened, it's clear that young people were not part of that story in large part. Now let's make sure then that as we grow, we've already met the NDP target, for example, on these crops, but we've met them without a lot of young people participation. But as we go further, uh, let's ensure that we, we don't uh, only celebrate uh, that expansion on its own, but we, we make it much more inclusive. And I think we know how to, to, to do that and we will need to, to proceed in that way. But I think the, the other important things, so which is why uh, when Kamhelo was making a point about compliance, I felt that she sh while it's good in the near term for her to utilize all of the existing markets that are around her, but I mean, the, the idea is to see Kamala growing and some of her colleagues and also participating in these export markets, which these graphs that you see on the board speak on. And obviously for her to be part of that story of exports, um, she will need to, to, to make some improvement on the compliance side. But now the question is to say, how do you lower the transaction costs of compliance uh, for medium, uh, small scale farming? And I think that's the dialogue um, that needs to happen. Because uh, uh, Mr. Msomi spoke about the exports that reached 10.2 billion last year. That was the second biggest uh, uh, export value in the history of South Africa. And it's represented by that uh, dark bluish line on your left-hand side graph in the screen. But now as those exports continue to go to a number of these countries that are on the right-hand side of your screen, Africa, in Asia, in, 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 in the Americas, young people and black people's produce needs to be part of that story. But all of that then will need that rigorous compliance, which we will need uh, to think about the effective ways um, of improving that while lowering the transaction costs and the efforts of, of, of doing that. And, and I guess it's part then of that uh, market access and also parts of, 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 of ensuring that the duality that exists, we fight uh, against that. And we already see uh, that, that, that in the sector with just the good activity that is happening in as far as growth and the other story that I was talking about, there is optimism. Uh, all that you need to know from that graph that is in the board there is that the line that shoots up, uh, which is above the middle line at 50, it shows what the sentiment from their existing co-ops and their agribusinesses. All of them are feeling good at the moment about the sector. In fact, they are now at the most optimistic level since this index started uh, in 2001. Then now is to say, as they are feeling good and they are generating enough revenue, what can be done then so that to ensure that the agribusinesses, which by itself, they are employers, are also part of the story. Um, of integrating um, uh, the youth into the formal value chain. Either then, obviously, they might, we might not have the resources in as far as land and stuff like that, which government is able to offer, but what, what sort of some of the training uh, mechanisms that is agribusinesses we should be thinking about. And I think that's the discussion that on our side, we will be reflecting deeply on. Um, and obviously, we, we're not only responsible for training people to come into the primary agricultural perspective, but for a range of internships in the value chain, for a range of in internships within the science side of agriculture, which Kosana, quite frankly, um, uh, um, sorry, Ndumiso, quite frankly, is practicing in that space. So how do we create more Ndumisos um, within the horticulture, more Ndumisos within the grain industry? And I think that's the contribution that is agribusinesses, at least in the near term, we could be mulling about uh, uh, ensuring that uh, that we, we do that. Because obviously that contribution gets to open up a range of opportunities for young people, even in a food value chain. Because all that you need to see in that busy picture that I'm showing on your screen is just the opportunities and the complexities of the South African food value chain. All of those players are what Kamhelo was talking about as far as saying, you produce here, 
and you are told about the veterinarian uh, issues in this point, and then you are told um, about the, the the other point of the of the slaughtering of your or in the abattoirs, and also sourcing your inputs. All of those distribution points that you are seeing in that food value chain, they offer opportunities for young people to say, how do they get integrated in there, and what skill set is needed, and what can all of those industries that are in their play. Um, in order to equip and integrate young people into their value chains, into their spaces, while government is also doing its part. Because I think we, we have to appreciate the fact that we're not all going to be farmers. Uh, many of us are going to be uh, sitting and farming in spreadsheets like myself. Some of you will be helping the minister to make policy. Some of you will be helping uh, guys at Sanvis uh, in dealing with storage of the grains. Some of you will be helping guys at Beefmaster um, a Senate group like uh, Ndumiso is doing. So in all of those points of entries, I think that's the complexities or maybe the, the, the scale of opportunities for young people to look into the agricultural uh, space. And uh, some of you who have not been fortunate to get to the university level, some of the jobs that exist in the value chain, they don't even require that, but rather they require a much more targeted training even if you don't have grade 12 or you have grade 12 or whatever way of level of education, but it's rather more of a, of a skill base uh, set up, which is why I think as agribusinesses working with government in talking about those opportunities and ways of incubation houses, that's the area that we will need um, to, to, to pretty much uh, 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 ensure. And obviously from a state side, as we have the minister on the call, the points that I'm, I've listed on the enablers arrow just below that complex chart that I have showed there, water, electricity, telecommunication, security in the farms, logistics, those are points and mechanisms that enable this complex value chain to function, which government needs to always ensure that those are, are in order. And I know uh, the minister's office is looking into some of those points, but I thought it's important uh, to, to highlight them again here in the, in the webinar. But I think that is my closing slides. We saw the, the colleagues on the call and all the young people, uh, you all uh, uh, know and have great expertise in as far as technology is concerned. As you're looking at all of these problems, you have to also think about what technological solutions um, that, that, that you can come up with. And obviously some of these will require capital um, and you, you, you will look in some of the other sources of funding and you can have discussions with a number of some of us that are on this call to say, one day you maybe know a few people, where can you point me, so you know a few people, where can you point me? But all of these, which are again in this map that I'm showing you are entry points under what, which young people can pretty much uh, uh, find opportunities on. Either it's on the big data and the precision farming space, Angosana um, spoke about that. There are wide opportunities even there to assist farmers now, even if you're not going to be the one that will be farming, but rather providing those solutions to the likes of Ngosana and the other guys. You can think about that entry point into the agricultural sector. On trading platforms, you can think about how do you aggregate the produce within a certain area and then you are the middleman taking that into into market, either arguing or getting in agreement with the with the with the retailers or wh whatever way that you will be dealing with. And I think that that trading platform and financing is another way at which you can utilize technology. There, we already know in South Africa, for example, startups such as Kula, which is run by Caridas and Matthew, is one of the few agricultural technologies that are have come into play, they are creating jobs within Kula, and also they are bringing uh, a much more efficient and, and, and affordable way of, of utilizing technology for market access for small and medium scale farmers. That's something that is already happening. And I think those are a number of menu of opportunities that we should be thinking about. And some might be on an information services side, which you could also play a, a notable role in there. But I guess, the, the, the bottom point here that I'm trying to uh, say is that this is an exciting sector. There, there are opportunities for young people. Many of you are already having your, your hands dirty and you know what the problems are. And I think that now we have to improve the communication between the folks that are, are actually doing the work on the ground, as well as us who are sitting on the services side and people that are assisting at the minister's offices at the department at large on saying, okay, how do we respond to these needs? And how do we ensure that the youth voice is consistently heard? 
And Bosana, I will speak now even um, in defense of the minister's office as my last point to say the youth, again, is not something that is being thought about only in, in, in June um, to the policy that I was referring about uh, on the land reform side, the, the beneficiary selection criteria. It prioritizes youth as well as the young people. But I guess it's because it's still new. And as it comes into implementation, maybe we will gain greater appreciation of that. But I do think that the, the pass through of information between Pretoria to where everyone is stationed is one of the things that could be could 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 be enhanced. But opportunities lie across the value chain of agriculture. And the last thing that I would implore people to think about a lot is around financing um, uh, of agriculture. Not to say you must have money, but what are some of the interesting in a most efficient way that you think financing in agricultural sector could work. Because then if you do have those ideas, you can begin to have conversation with people who are sitting with money, but not sure how to deploy it productively in agriculture and in a least risky way. And I think that young people tend to be much more agile and refreshing and have new ideas around that. And I think that we need to think about agriculture as this complex machine with a number of areas under which we can plug our unique skills on. And we have to think it in, in that nature of way. And we have to have these consistent dialogues to share those ideas and have uh, a flow of good communication amongst ourselves. And maybe through that, then the growth story that I shared in my earlier slides might not be leaning in a few um, older hands. And, and I mean, we know from data that uh, average age of a farmer in South Africa is somewhere around about 60, 62. Then, then, then this growth should not only lean in those older folks, but rather young people should be part and parcel of growing this pie. And I think we can attain that. And, and that's the discussion that we need uh, to consistently have. So let me stop there. I've, I've been speaking a lot, but I thank you so much again, colleagues, for, for joining us and sharing your stories um, in this call. Thank you very much, Wandele. I think you've highlighted really some good overall picture on the health of the sector and really some of the other areas that uh, possesses opportunities for the young people, because not everyone has to be in the farming space, but I think you've highlighted a few around the technology, around the finance and other uh, services that are required for those farmers who are on the ground should be able to produce their food in the most efficient way. May I then uh, ask the minister to come back on the floor. I will continue to read some of your engagement on the, on the commentary. I do take note that some of you have been having difficulty to use your mic, but you have placed your commentary and I think most of them really resonate with what our panelists have highlighted as some of the key and part of the missions that they are driving as youth in agriculture. Minister, I hope your mic has uh, and your, your system has been restored, I am told. Can I then ask you to take the floor, please? Thank you very much, uh, Sviso. I'm not sure whether you can't allow one or two other questions from the floor. Or did you want me just to intervene or are we concluding? Um, not yet, Minister. We still have some time to convene. I was uh, hoping to reflect on the initial part of it, but we can certainly take that opportunity to take more questions from the floor. If I could have anyone who wants to take the floor on this opportunity. Some Minister, they were struggling with, the, with their mic. I think the system was sort of inhibiting them to make the comment and they've put them on the commentary section. Let's try to have one or two hands, please. Let me take uh, Luyanda Lunga and Lazarus, sorry, and see if we can have them on the floor, Minister. Luyanda, are you able to take the floor? Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Luyanda um, from the Tuli. Um, I'm a livestock farmer I'm farming in a common age. Uh, we have a lot of challenges in this space, I've noted also in the, in the neighboring towns. Um, starting from um, the breed um, that we have, we are not able to, to control the type of breeds that we want to farm with um, because we don't have any fences, we don't have camps, and this results into inbreeding, and we have a lot of uncontrolled diseases in the space. And now the effect of this is that our animals have uh, poor mostly. And when we are selling our winners mostly, we, we have challenges in terms of the price. 
um, all the agents and the, and the feed loans which are buying from us, they are refusing to buy at the national price because of the condition of our animals. And for now, we are not able um, to assist ourselves in this. I'm wondering from the government um, side, are the programs which are meant to develop common farmers? Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Luyanda. Let me then try to also be cognizant of the issues of gender and then also allow Norma Temba, if she is able to speak now. Norma Temba Langa. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Please go ahead. Okay. Good day to the minister and to you, Dr. Sefisto, and the panelists at large. Uh, my name is Norma Temba Langa and I am a farmer. So I was listening to the panelists as they were talking about uh, the integrated uh, blended financing and access to markets. And I'd like to take myself an example to say, I've, uh, I've managed to acquire an environmental impact assessment. I've got your water rights. I've got a 326 hectares of land and I've applied um, at Land Bank through the jobs fund. And I was one of um, the pan, not even panelists. I was one of the candidates that was nominated into their list. And I never even got feedback from the department as to saying um, what happened afterwards. I don't know. Um, I went to IDC to saying, okay, um, this is everything that I have. I've got a market. Um, which basically states that they want 300 um, baconers on a weekly basis. So basically everything that they've been talking about and all the boxes I've been able to take. I even went to IDC and when I got to IDC, they said, no, you can't be in contact with us, but let's uh, put you in contact with the guys from SAPO. And I said, okay, no, cool. And then we had a meeting with them. And then I've got an environmental impact assessment study for a 300 cell unit. And before it was said that with a 250 cell unit, you can break even. Now, when you go to the financial institutions, it's 350 cell unit and more. So they were telling me that, no, I need to um, upgrade my environmental impact assessment from a 300 cell unit to a 350 cell unit. Then they will start considering me. And my question was, but I've got the business plan that states and shows I, I, I actually went and got the quotations and everything. And here you are telling me that I cannot qualify for this loan, you know. And through all of that, I still managed to say, okay, no, it's fine. With what I have, let me do my own processing. So I've got my own butchery. I've um, started my own brand called Inyama Yetu, which is picking up slowly but surely. And I'm also doing training. But my question is, what about the other youths who don't have this opportunity that I have in order to say, okay, I can be able to maneuver around this whole value chain system. Because even when you go to the abattoirs as a small scale farmer, um, when I want to slaughter there, because basically I take 10 to 20 uh, carcasses on a monthly basis, I don't have space sometimes they will tell you no you can't book in because you've got so little um pigs for this time you know we're expecting x numbers so that as well cripples or um or actually plays a huge role as a disadvantage to me and my produce as a farmer so my question is or my challenge would be to the department yes we've got this dialogue in 2021 that we're discussing, we're stating out our problems and our challenges, we're putting it out there. But what happens next? Can't we have a dialogue next year where we've got the st statistics that show that, okay, after the dialogue, the government was actually being able to put into consideration and maybe there was a committee that actually went out to young farmers and they were helping them. And this is what came out from there. So that this thing builds on from, from here um, till the next generations to come, just like the youth of 1976. They marched until today, we're still talking about it. So can we then say from 2021 to further on, the government was stand on our
give it to um, Deboho. Um, I see your hand, and then I can give it back to Ms. If you can just tolerate one more minute. Um, Deboho, if you can just come in, in very brief. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Tebo Malele. I'm from the from CERNIC and Jobs Fund Emerging Farmers Project. I think the question I want to ask is, uh, how is the department uh, going to deal or willing to deal with the issue of corruption in terms of the acquisition of land? Uh, because for we have seen in, in many instances that there are many people who have managed to get the land who don't, who are not, don't, don't really deserve. And some, they do get it because uh, of who they know and where they know them and stuff. So how that they are going to deal with that and to make sure that there's transparency in terms of uh, the processes of land acquisition. I think that is the, the most important thing. And the other most important thing is that what is the department doing with the land that is not productive? They give land, but the land is not productive. And there are extension officers who monitor such and they can see that because we travel all over and we see such. So what is the department willing to do? Because that type of the land that can be uh, occupied by young people who can be able to do much better with it compared to what is used for at the current moment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Thank that you was much, very pleasant. If you could just speak of your mind. Um, may I then invite the minister to come and give us a reflection as we move towards the closure. Thank you. No, thank you very much, uh, Sviso, as well as to the panelists and the youth that have participated and the senior officials. It's very clear that in the brief conversation that we have had, I wish we had a lot of them so that we can allow for more young people to engage with us. Some of the issues that the panelists have shared with us relate to the responsiveness of government in relation to the offerings that government has, which I think there's a concern. Uh, some of the young people say I've been taken from pillar to post and clearly it does not seem we have got uh, aligned processes that would work for the benefit of our young uh, producers and agro dealers as well as agribusiness enterprises. The other issues that came up was compliance um, that is required, particularly when it comes to market access. And I would actually say, I appreciate Kamukhelo what you've been doing in terms of taking advantage of the live market, which is good, and really encouraging young people that uh, while you are working on some of these issues of compliance, don't sit on your laurels, do something about it. You can have the live, live market from which to grow. But I think it would be important to find a way in which you can have another conversation of how we can take uh, young people through to some of these issues of standards, uh, which we must comply with in terms of agricultural production, both in terms of food safety for our own local market uh, and at the country level, but at the same time, looking at complying with your international and export market, because those are crucial. Even if one may not be ready now, but we need to prepare for readiness so that uh, as young people continue can capture those markets. There are issues that have been raised and I must say that I was excited um, when the panelists were sharing their experiences in Dumiso who have been working in this space for some time, but how he has actually taken an advantage of working as a consultant to actually use the experience gain. But in that, highlighting where there are gaps from where he sits that make farmers big and small from the black community not being able to actually maximize uh, the resources that they have for better use. And I think the issue of livestock improvement became much more clear from where uh, he was uh, sharing with us and also how we could use the entirety of the value chain and maybe building on some of the programs that uh, government has made, particularly the one on the red meat uh, producer development, particularly the uh, um, 
feedlots that were built, which I think we might need to relook together with the ARC as to how those uh, become really facilities that can optimize uh, livestock production in a number of uh, areas. Um, also, Mdambo raised very interesting issues from the perspective of a, a young farmer who started very early, the challenges, but also what are the opportunities that are there that young people uh, can take uh, advantage of. We've heard from Wandile as well, who have shared with us uh, what are the opportunities that are there that we can take advantage of in terms of uh, your market access and looking at the various, um, I will say, career paths that are there in agriculture so that we appreciate the broadness of the sector that not all of us may be in the farming, some of us may be in the public sector, but some of us may also be in the private sector where we can participate in various um, elements of the sector. Government officials have also shared what is there. And I must say that uh, the other panelists or other speakers in the platform have also raised the issue of uh, how we will deal with issues of malfeasance and uh, corruption, particularly in the land allocation space. Yes, uh, we deal with those issues. There are consequences for those who have been found wanting. And this is where I think partnership is important so that we don't speak in generalities. If they actually wrongdoing in some of our offices, it is important that those matters must be raised up front with the uh, senior managers and even with the deputy ministers or ministers so that we can address those issues immediately and don't dent the work that government is doing in supporting the agricultural sector. And I would like to say thank you very much to everybody who has participated and appreciate what was raised by Noma Temba, the need for monitoring so that we don't come back here once again to talk as though we were not here in the previous year, but make an assessment and look at how far we've gone. Terry Nobe raised the issue of importance in terms of our policy and how we are targeting young people, 40%. How do we actually measure to that so that in the coming year, we can say in terms of land allocation, this is how far we went in terms of young people. In terms of other uh, procurement of services, this is how far we have actually seen the market share of young people increasing. So I think the issue uh, Noma Temba is raised is very important so that it doesn't just remain a statement of intent, but we actually make sure that we implement it and we can see it work. And I would like to applaud some of the young people like Amuhelo and some of the programs that she has partnered with um, television uh, station, I think it's SABC, where she, again, from the young perspective, speak about the issues of agriculture, challenges that are there, access to land and so on, because it does profile the work that we all seek to do, but also it does create confidence amongst young people to actually see one of their own who is doing uh, something that uh, in a number of, uh, communities, it might still have been seen as no agriculture, it's for only old people or those who are commercially uh, farming from the historically advantaged uh, communities. And I think that has been a game changer. But also Sadiko, one of uh, South African citizens who have been having workshops uh, almost every month, looking at various issues among which is agriculture. Last year, we had serious engagement with him where he was looking at issues of market access, the Africa continental free trade area, as well as the role of youth and women in agriculture. And we'd like to say thank you to him because that was an initiative from a South African citizen who actually saw that this is the space for growth. This is the important sector of our economy that we need to pay attention to and see how we share the information. The other issues that have come out clearly relate to communication and how we actually ensure that what is 
available within government, not just in the Department of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development, but across government, which would assist young entrepreneurs is easily accessible and is shared. And I hope after this webinar, there will be a lot of engagement between ourselves, as well as those uh, young people who have uh, raised important uh, issues uh, with us. Other issues that came from the chats looks at the partnership between our department as well as other government departments to create market access for farmers, such as the Department of Defense, Correctional Services, as well as Department of Health and Education. Those that are bigger, that have got the capacity from which uh, they can consume uh, what uh, young producers and producers in general are actually uh, providing. With those few words, I would like to say thank you very much uh, to you and all for participating uh, in this webinar.